Good morning, Glen Cove Christian Church. We are glad that you are here for another Sunday. We are continuing our series um, this week called Lights, Camera, Action. It's all about action. As a matter of fact, we are going through the book of Acts. Some people call it the Acts of the Apostles. Some people refer to it as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I think any of those titles would be appropriate because as you read through this book, you see that it is all about action. And it's all about action that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I think that book, for me at least, it makes it a very inspirational book. I love the doctrinal books too. You know, when we read the letters and it tells us, and there's some action in that as well, but a lot of it is about um, direction and correction and doctrine and stuff like that. And we need that stuff and we preach that stuff as well. Okay. But we can't ignore the action. Christianity is not just a belief system. It is a lifestyle. And so that means that it is, it is how we live out our faith. It's not just an, an intellectual faith. It's not just a belief or moral system. It's about changing the world. And we see that in the book of Acts as we're going through that. So, um, hey, I just want to say good morning to you guys. and glad that you're on here, and I'm excited about continuing um, this series today. Who do we have on here? I, I encourage you to use this time as a, as a fellowship time to connect with each other and um, just to, uh, to use this as, as, I guess, as a replacement for what we do when we're in the building. We're shaking hands and and giving hugs and stuff like that. So hey, we've got uh, we've got Mervin and Heather on here saying good morning. Uh, good morning to you guys. Glad that you're on here. Um, who else we got on here this morning? That's up and early and ready to go. There's Chris Petrella on here saying good morning to the family. You know, I love I love the fact this church is so. Family oriented. That's the best word for it. We feel like a family. Good morning there, Apollonia. We feel like a family. And and the new people that we've had come in since I've been here, that's the thing that they tell me. Even some of those that came in before I came, when they tell me about the reason they came, is they just they felt like family or it felt like home. I hear that phrase a lot. And so uh you know, I I love that. I love that about this church. And a matter of fact. In May of 2019, when my family and I came and visited here and I preached my first message and I interviewed uh, with the elders, one of the things that we talked about as we left that weekend is how we felt so welcomed. Look, we weren't even offered the position at that time, but yet we just felt so welcome. It felt like home to us, and, and it has been no different um, the year that we've been here. Hey, Laura, good to see you. Uh, we got Michael on here. Oh, we got Marianne and Vinny. They're from up in the Catskills this weekend, and they're watching online as well. Uh, we've got Karen on here. All right. Hey, I'm loving it, guys. This is good stuff. Anybody got any jokes while we're uh, – this week. Oh, yeah. If you watched Tojo this week, what did you think about it? Um, this is the first time that we actually did it pre-recorded. We want to do it live. Our, our preference is to do it live so that we can interact with everybody. Neither Joe or myself was available this past Wednesday. And so we pre-recorded it and had me and Joe and Allie and Tammy on there just talking about our experience. Uh, Facing the reality over the past four months of what that has been like. So if you watched it, if you if you watched it this past Wednesday or or anytime, you didn't have to watch it right at the time. Let us know what you what you thought about that. Um, we may be in a situation where we have to do that again. So uh, your input uh, is greatly appreciated. All right. There's Joni's on here. Love to see that. I love the fact that you guys are, are interacting with each other. Uh, Chris Petrella said it was funny and a good show. <laughs> yeah, we've got some, we got a lot of funnies on there. We, we share on that show some of the mishaps. Maybe some of you guys haven't seen. Now, you've seen some of them. 
you know, like Amy accidentally going to, to Allie while she's drinking from her coffee mug and, <laughs> you know, goes phone going off in the middle of communion and stuff like that. You guys have witnessed some of those. Believe me, there's a lot of them that you have not seen <laughs> that has taken place. And, uh, and we kind of reflect on that in that show and just, I mean, you just laugh about it. That's it. You know what, you know, what's crazy about it 10 years from now, you're not going to, you're not going to remember the messages, but you'll remember those funny moments, those mishaps. We remember those things. They, they're, they're hooks, they're mental hooks for us. And so they just uh, stick with us. All right. How long we going till 10 fifties, 54, going to 10 54 today. So I've got about three more minutes. Hey, I don't know if I've shared this joke yet or not, but I'm going to share this. This is a cool joke. What did the digital clock say to the analog clock? Look, no hands. Oh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> My family's shaking their heads and groaning as I, as I share this. They've heard so much corn and cheese over the past 14 to 20 years that um, it's kind of become old hat to them. So anybody else got any jokes? <laughs> if you don't like mine, let me hear yours. <laughs> Chris says we need a blooper reel. We do. Maybe at the end of this pandemic, we could, we could show like our first meeting back a blooper reel of the past, uh, past four months. We got Tammy Sanders on here um, from Stormy, Michigan. Like, is that the name of the town, or is it like Stormy? In there? I, I think it's Storming oh. there. I don't think that's the name of the town. Oh, could be the name of the town. Um, Aura is giving me an LOL. I'm assuming that's in reference to my joke. So thank you, Aura. Thank you for for laughing at that. Apollonia's got an SMH, which means shaking my head. Bad. Hey, I'll take what I can get. Okay. <laughs> As long as I'm not ignored, I'm okay. <laughs> oh man, we got, we got several people on here today already just interacting. Yeah. I love this, guys. I love this. Hey, listen, we want to get back in this building as soon as we can. I know some of you guys are chomping at the bit. Um, we're we're still meeting and praying and discussing. Our options with this, uh, we're we're throwing around some ideas of doing something outside. Uh, we're just we're just kind of we're just kind of brainstorming our way through this. Okay, there there are some churches that have opened up. Uh, the majority have not yet, and uh, just keep in mind that we actually did not have church a week before we were required not to have church in the building. Uh, and let me add that, not have church in the building. We've had church every week. Um, we did not have church in the building a week before we even started. So, uh, oh my. Well, hold on, hold on. Here's a joke. Oh. You putting it up? Why did Snoopy stop working for the comic strip? Because he was tired of working for Peanuts. <laughs> Note, I love it. I love it. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate it. On that note, we are going to move into our countdown and into our service. We will see you back here at 11 o'clock, guys. I love you.
great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine your grace abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me You've never failed And you won't start now You won't start now And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine ooh, 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 Spirit without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior a spirit lead me where my, my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters Whenever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior And I will call upon your name above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth.
to the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. Good morning, friends, and welcome again to the Glen Cove Christian Church. We want to thank you for joining us online again this morning to praise and worship Jesus. You know, today Tommy's going to continue our sermon series, Lights, Camera, Action, with his message, Trouble. And as I mentioned last week, Acts was written by the Apostle Luke, who was a physician and historian, and Acts is the only biblical book that chronalizes the history of the church immediately after Jesus's ascension. And it provides us an amazing and exciting account of how the church was able to grow and spread from Jerusalem until the, until the rest of the Roman Empire. And friends, while we're not able to meet together in the building, we're actively exploring possible alternatives. We can't wait to get back together. This Wednesday from six to seven, Tojo Live will again be hosted on our Facebook Live page. Please, we ask you to join us. It's always a great time. It's a time where Tommy and I can pray and also uh, share with you and hear from you some of the things that are on your mind, perhaps some of the challenge that you're facing during this uh, pandemic. Again, friends, I just want to take a moment and sincere, sincerely thank each and every one of you for your support, your prayers during this, this time. Um, thanks for supporting the, the church online or through the mail. We greatly appreciate it. We love you. We praise you. And we pray for your families, your friends, and each of you. God bless you. I can 
Friends, will you please bow your heads and join me as we pray, as we go to God together? Father God, we gather online this morning as your children to praise and worship you. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for our lives and our families, and we thank you for our loved ones and friends. But most of all, dear God, we thank you for the incredible gift of your son, Jesus. Father, we're a nation that needs you. In your wisdom, you've come to us and you've told us that we need to come together and that we need to treat each other with respect and, and forgive each other and mend fences. And Father, that's what we're called to do. Through your eyes, let us show goodness and beauty and show every human being that they're respected and they're loved. Father, open our minds and our hearts this morning as your children with courage and wisdom. Father, we just love you. We, we pray that you enable every single person to see that there's a greater force at work in the world. And that is the love, the love of you, Father, that can be spread by those of us who believe in your almighty power and accept your son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. Father, for those who've been afflicted physically by COVID-19, for those who are struggling financially, we pray that you would ease their burden. And again, dear God, we thank you for our healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, the first responders, and all the public servants who have and put themselves in harm's way for us. Father, we pray that those who are fearful uh, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, wipe away their anxiety. And Father, this morning I just ask that each of us would, would keep my dear brother Fred and Rose uh, and their brother, Fred's twin brother, uh, Richard, in, in your prayers. Um, Richard lost his, his daughter, Julie, yesterday, and we're praying for their family, for their, for their uh, peace as they mourn. And let me just ask you and invite you to each join me aloud in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I need 
person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles feet and they would be distributed to each as any had needed but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it he laid it at the apostles feet now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the need of Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. It should be somewhat encouraging to us to know that the problems in the church are nothing new and knowing that the early church was made up of people who made mistakes. In the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they tried to deceive the apostles while the Hellenistic Jews complained to the apostles about the discrimination against their widows. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have con why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval and with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas a prolocyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira were exposed and disciplined by God himself. Regarding the Hellenistic Jews, the apostles chose the wise course of self-examination, seeing that the complaints were based on a real problem. They solved that problem by delegating responsibility to others and by encouraging the whole church to be involved. The Bible tells us that we need to take a good long look at what is going on in our hearts when we partake in the Lord's Supper. Let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup to ensure that our relationship with Christ is authentic and genuine. The Lord's Supper is not only a reminder of his death, but it is also a celebration of the incredibly generous grace of God and the invaluable privilege of being forgiven.
Thanks, Carol, and that was beautiful. Friends, we're now going to enter into a time of communion. It's a time for each of us to remember that no matter what we're going through, no matter what challenges we face, that Jesus brings us salvation and that God will bring us peace. So if you'd like to partake, please have a piece of bread or cracker, a cup of juice or wine. Friends, on the night he was betrayed, during the Last Supper, while the disciples were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this all of you and eat it, for this is my body. It'll be given up for you and for all men so that sins would be forgiven. And then Jesus said, do this in memory of me. Let us partake. When supper was ended, Jesus took a cup. And Father, he gave you thanks and praise. And then he gave the cup to his disciples and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is my blood, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant, my blood, that will be shed for you and for all men, so that sins would be forgiven. And then Jesus said, do this in memory of me. And Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the end of the earth. week we began a 30 year 30,000 mile journey through the book of Acts we covered the first four acts or the first four chapters of the book of Acts which covered about a, a year's worth of time in there and for the most part the gospel is still centrally located right in and around Jerusalem today as we go into uh, further into the book of Acts, as we go into further Acts, <laughs> we are looking at somewhere around the end of 30 AD to the beginning of 31 AD. And realize, remember what we talked about last week, that everything in the book of Acts stems from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And as I said last week in the first four chapters of the first four Acts, we were primarily just in Jerusalem. We are going to, when we begin today, as we begin today, we are going to start there in Jerusalem, but we are getting ready to see some experiences in the church that maybe we haven't seen so far in this first year or so of the church. We begin to see some trouble. We begin to see some problems rise in the church, and we're going to see how they handled each one of those problems, and each one was handled differently. I think we can learn from that as individuals and as a church. When we have troubles, when we have problems, how do we handle those? And I believe we could look at these examples here and say, okay, maybe in this situation, this is the way that we handle it. We're going to look at, and I believe in each act, we're going to cover Acts chapter 5 through 9 today. And I believe in each chapter, they have a unique problem, they have unique trouble, and they handle it 
in a unique way. All right, we are getting into it now. We covered Acts 1 through 4 last week. Remember, lights, camera, action. We're going into Act 5. Remove it. Remove it. What does that mean? Well, let's jump into this. As you heard Carolyn share the, the story during communion time of Ananias and Sapphira, the church at this time, it was young, didn't have a whole lot of money. Uh, if you've ever been in, involved in a church plant, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Those first few years, you just don't have any money. Uh, and but you, but you're still moving. On. You got a lot of motivation, a lot of desire, and a lot of expectations, and so you just run with it. And that's kind of like the early church. They didn't have a lot of money, but man, they had a desire, they had a passion, they had a motivation that could not be stopped. And some people were so motivated by this that they were selling their land, they were selling their property, and they were bringing the money to the church and laying it at the apostles' feet and say, they're saying, here it is, use it as you see fit. We know the church is in a situation where they need the finances. I wish we lived in a world where we didn't need finances, but we do. We do. And as the church operates, it needs financial support. And so these people were selling their properties and their homes and bringing the money and laying it before the apostles. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they bring a sum of money. We don't know how much it was. But they bring a sum of money pretending like they sold their property and this is all the money they got from that property. They brought it to Peter. Peter. Ananias goes in first. And Ananias is confronted with the fact that he is lying. Now realize, nobody said Ananias and Sapphira had to sell their property. Nobody said that if they did sell their property, that they had to bring all the money they made from the property to the church. Nobody was saying that. Nobody got up in the pulpit and says, this is what you got to do if you're a true follower of Jesus. Nobody was saying that. People were doing this out of their inner motivation. It came from within. It wasn't because somebody was putting them on a guilt trip or anything like that. It came from within. And not everybody was doing it, but a lot of people were doing it. And Ananias and Sapphira wanted to get in on the act. Now you, you realize what's going on here. They're bringing this money to the church, pretending like it is all the money that they got from the selling of their property. But yet they were holding some back. Is it okay that they held some back? Absolutely. The problem wasn't that they held it back. The problem is that they were dishonest about it. They were dishonest about it. And who knows why they were doing this? Maybe they wanted to be held in high esteem with the others that were doing this. And they thought, well, who do they think they are? We can do that too. And so they did it, but they didn't do it. They just pretended to do it. I believe one of the things that God has a problem with above and beyond anything else is pretending. Pretending. Jesus got more indignant with the religious leaders who were acting like they had it all together than he ever did with the drunks and the prostitutes that knew they didn't have it all together. Don't pretend. Don't pretend. I think that's one of the things we can learn from Ananias and Sapphira. And so Ananias is confronted with this by Peter, the fact that he has lied, not just to man, but to the Holy Spirit. You know what happens to Ananias? Boom. Down. He dies. A little bit later, Sapphira comes in. Ananias' wife. Peter asked her straight up, is this all the money you got from the sale of your property? And she goes, yes, yes, it is. You know what happens to her? He's out. She dies. Now, let me just say, God is a gracious, loving, compassionate God. 
He is not waiting for you to just mess up so that he can pounce on you. He's not waiting for you to mess up so that he can strike you dead. I don't think the Ananias and Sapphira situation was a situation where we have a couple that was a good quality, upright Christian couple. They just messed up. I think we have a couple that never genuinely followed Jesus. I believe we have a couple here that got caught up in this new movement that was going on. They never genuinely gave their heart to Jesus. And God knew their hearts. He knew the situation with a church that was young. And God decided that it was best to strike them dead. He removed the problem. He removed the trouble. Now, I think we can learn from that principle. Now, do not get me wrong. <laughs> it is never up to you to take somebody's life. Never, ever, ever. As long as your life is not immediately in danger, it is never right to take somebody's life. I think the principle we can learn from this is sometimes the troubles that we have in our lives need to be removed. Maybe it's a toxic relationship we just need to get out of. Maybe it's a toxic work environment where we just need to quit and get another job. Now, maybe you should get the other job before you quit, but start taking action, start taking steps toward getting out of that. <clears throat> Sometimes when we have troubles, then maybe the best way to take care of that problem is just to eliminate it. Get out of your life. I think that's what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. As we go on through Act 5 here, we will see again how Peter and the other apostles are being persecuted because they are continuing to preach and to teach the name of Jesus. And a matter of fact, Peter once again is brought before the Sanhedrin. Peter and some of the other apostles, they are brought before the Sanhedrin, kind of the Jewish council of the day. We saw this happen on more than one occasion in the first four chapters of Acts. Now we see it happening, happening again in chapter five of Acts. And they wanted to kill them because they were not listening. They were wanting to kill them. But this wise intelligent, thought-out person by the name of Miliel stood up. He said, hey, listen, guys, we've heard of movements like this before. This whole Jesus thing, we've heard of this. It's happened. And when the leader died, eventually it died out. He gives a couple of examples of that. And so here this movement is very, very young. It's only about a year old at this point. And he's saying, let's give it time. Look at what Gamaliel says here in chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. He says, therefore, the present case, I advise you. Remember, Peter and some of the other apostles are before the Sanhedrin. They're wanting to kill them. This is what Gamaliel says. Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Now realize, Belial was not a follower of Jesus. But I think he understood that there may be something here. We don't know the, the, the rest of the life of Gamaliel. We know that he was one of the guys that helped educate and train Paul, as we will look at Paul a little later in this book. He's one of the, one of the guys that, that educated and trained Paul. We don't really know a whole lot about Gamaliel beyond that. I can't help but wonder, if maybe somewhere down the line, Miliel gave his life to Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. Because in what he says here, it sounds almost like he's about halfway there anyway. At the worst, 
He has the wisdom to say, guys, let's just see how this plays out. If it's from human origin, it's going to fail just like all those others have failed. If it's not, there's nothing you can do to stop it anyway. So why do this? <laughs> so they end up just beating <laughs> Peter and the other apostles instead of killing them. They just want to teach them a lesson. So they beat them and send them on their way. Now, you know what's amazing? As we, as we begin to close out Act 5, you know what the response of Peter and the other apostles were to this beating, this persecution, these number of arrests and confrontations from the Sanhedrin and the authorities. You know what the response is to this? Look at this in Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They were beaten. They were arrested. They were put in jail. They were threatened with their lives. And what did they do? They rejoiced because they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace. The name, you know what name they're talking about, right? That name, that name that is above every other name. A name that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. We talked about that last week. That name is Jesus. It's Jesus. If there was any other way, you think the apostles would have gone through this? Probably not. They knew it was the only way to the Father, the only way to heaven. And that's why they risk their lives on a daily basis, continue to teach and proclaim the good news, the good news, the good news that Jesus is Messiah. It's not just news. It's not just some comforting news. It is the good news. And it is only in Jesus. It's in Jesus. So the next time you're made fun of, the next time you feel like that maybe you're persecuted or rejected or something because you stand firm on the name of Jesus, rest assured you're in good company. Rejoice that you have been counted worthy of being persecuted, humili humiliated, and disgraced for the name of Jesus. We're closing out Act 5. We're coming into Act 6. Solve it. We learned in Act 5, sometimes when we have trouble, sometimes it's best just to eliminate it, to remove it. Sometimes we need to look at the situation and see what we could do to solve it. How do we solve the problem? How do we solve the situation that we're in? We see in Act 6, in Chapter 6, that there is trouble in the distribution of food. At this point, understand we are still in Jerusalem. For the most part, people being reached with the gospel are Jewish people. You have a group of what we call Hebraic Jews, which are steeped in Jewish tradition. We have Hellenistic Jews, which have a lot of adopted a lot of the Greek culture. They they speak Greek. That's their common language. They've adopted some of the Greek. Culture, and there's this separation between the two. And as the church is trying to help take care of everybody's needs, because you realize when people were bringing their, the money they made from their property that they had sold and their homes and stuff like that, they were distributing this money out as was needed because they were such a unified, common group. <laughs> they were helping everybody out. Apparently, the Hellenistic Jews or the Grecian Jews, the Greek Jews, were being overlooked. The apostles decided, hey, guys, we cannot take our attention from the teaching of the word, the teaching and the preaching of the word. You see, there's different ministries within the church. And the apostles were, were so focused on teaching, that they felt like what they needed to do was to give this ministry to somebody else. And so they chose from among them a list of people who, by the way, all had Greek names. These were the first 
deacons. These were the first what we call ministers. Realize that in the New Testament, deacon, minister, and servant are all synonyms. They mean the same thing. Just like uh, pastor, elder, and bishop all mean the same thing. I know that may mean different. Those terms may have different meanings in different traditions. In the New Testament, they're all the same. Pastor, elder, bishop is all the same. Deacon, minister, servant, all the same word. So what they did here is they chose some leaders for this ministry. It's a great example for the church. When we have a ministry that needs to be done, get a leader that connects with that ministry and give it to them. Empower them, teach them, train them in leadership responsibility, and then let them go. Oftentimes in the church, we want to control everything instead of empowering leaders and then letting them go to lead that particular ministry. You know, a church can be set up for control or they can be set up for growth, but it cannot be set up for both. And I believe the church in the book of Acts was set up more for growth than it was control. And so they chose from among them these first deacons. And one of those deacons was Stephen. And Stephen, later on in, in Acts 6, chapter 6, is seized. He is caught. And he is, in order to bring them before the Sanhedrin, they set up a falsehood. They, they pay a group of people to, to say that Stephen did and said things that he didn't really do. And he's brought before the Sanhedrin. Now, as Act 6 closes out, I want you to, to see how the Sanhedrin saw Stephen when they looked at him. Look at this in Acts chapter 6, verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Listen, guys, here again, he's he's been taught not officially arrested. This is more of a mob type thing, but he's been caught again. He's brought before the Sanhedrin like Peter and the other apostles had been. <laughs> they look at him. He doesn't have this, this look of worry or concern or stress or, or anxiety. He said he had a face like the face of an angel. Can you imagine the peace that had come over Stephen as he it's an opportunity to share the gospel with the Sanhedrin. So, guys, what do we learn from, from Acts 6? If you have a problem, sometimes we just need to look for solutions to solve it. That may be delegating it. It may be getting help with it. It may be learning more about it. It may be investigating it, but looking at ways that we can solve a problem. Sometimes we want to remove it. Like in Acts 5, sometimes we want to solve it like in Acts 6. All right, we're going to Act number 7. Face it. Sometimes when you have trouble, it's just best to face it. There may not be a way to fix it, but you can face it head on. And we are continuing the story of Stephen here. Remember in Acts 6, we left Stephen in front of the Sanhedrin. And Stephen sees an opportunity to preach the gospel. He does it in this magnificent way. And I would encourage you, I hope you're reading ahead of time with this. But if you haven't, I would encourage you to go back and at least read Acts chapter 7. If you want a summary of the Old Testament, this may be the best summary you will ever get of the Old Testament. When Stephen gives his speech in Acts chapter 7, he begins to go through the history of Israel, beginning with Abraham and how Abraham was chosen by God and was sealed with a covenant, the covenant of circumcision, become the father of a new nation. And from Abraham came Isaac, and from Isaac, Name Jacob. And just in case you didn't know, Jacob's name was eventually changed to Israel. 
Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel are descendants of the man Israel. The 12 tribes of the nation of Israel are descendants of individual Israel. He goes on through this story and he tells his story. Joseph, who was one of the sons of Jacob or of Israel, ends up being traded off by his brothers because they were jealous of him and his relationship with his father. God uses this for good and, and begins to, to be able to bless the other Israelites at this point through Joseph because Joseph had been traded to Egypt and he had worked his way up to a, a place of authority. He was able to bring his dad and his brothers in and be able to take care of them. There were around 70 to 75 people at this point, and they become a part of Egypt during a famine that they probably would have died out, or potentially died out because of this famine because they were able to be brought into Egypt by Joseph, the very ones who betrayed him, his brothers loved them and saved their lives by bringing them to Egypt. Now, over the course of about 400 years, the Pharaoh or the king that brought Joseph up to a place of authority, he had died, new kings had come, They'd forgotten all about Joseph and they had actually made the Israelites slaves. They were not free men in Egypt. They were not free women in Egypt. They were slaves. And after about 400 years, God raises from them a man by the name of Moses. If you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, you know that Moses is an esteemed individual when it comes to the history of Israel because Moses is the one who led the nation of Israel out of Egypt into freedom. Now, the interesting thing about Moses is Stephen is telling this story. He brings up this quote from Moses. It's in Acts chapter 7, verse 37. It says, this is the Moses, not a quote from Moses, but a quote from the Old Testament. This is the Moses, the old Israelite. God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. See what Moses said there? God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. You know who he's talking about there? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Stephen goes on to connect the history of Israel, the prophecy of Israel, everything that happened in the Old Testament and how it leads to Jesus as the Messiah. He confronts them with the fact that the very reason you are arresting me is the very thing that Moses and the prophets talked about is the Messiah and his name is Jesus. And he is the only way to the Father. He upsets and angers the Sanhedrin so much that they stone him to death. They stone him to death. See, Stephen maybe couldn't fix this problem. He faced it. He didn't back down from it. He preached the gospel in the midst of it faced his trouble head on. And here's the amazing thing about Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, verse 60, as his life is slipping out of his body, it says, then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now we talked We've talked before about the fact that sometimes the scripture says fell asleep when it means he died. He died. The last thing Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. The very ones who were killing him was asking for forgiveness. 
kind of makes you think about Jesus on the cross, doesn't it? When Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. You see, Stephen was such a follower of Jesus. When faced with a similar situation, he responded in a similar way. He forgave those who were killing him. That closes out Act 7. Now we go to Act 8. Burn it. Burn it. Sometimes with our problems, we got to remove it. Sometimes with our troubles, we can solve it. Sometimes with our troubles, we can face it. And sometimes we just turn it. We turn it upside down. This is the cool thing about this. Remember, we just closed out Act 7 with Stephen being stoned to death because of his preaching of the gospel. He is our first martyr. He is the first one that has literally been killed. There will be many more, and there continues to be many more that have been killed because of the Christian faith. But Stephen was the first. Whoa. What happens now? We'll look in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On that day, on that day, the day that Stephen was killed, that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, leave that up there for just a second. Notice where they were scattered. Throughout Judea and Samaria. Do those look familiar? If you've got your Bibles, or if you can remember what we've talked about last week and this week, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And we've we've covered the span of, of more than a year now. We're we're two or three years removed in here now. And they are moving from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. Now, what do they do with that? Well, we're going to skip down to verse four. Look at what verse four says. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Hey, guys, we have gone into the second leg of Acts 1-8. Isn't it interesting that Acts 1-8 begins its fulfillment in Acts 8-1? It just seems interesting to me. Maybe I'm the only one who thinks that way. In Acts 8-1, we see where they were scattered. Why? Because of persecution, because of death. They were scattered into the regions of Judea and Samaria. They are leaving Jerusalem because they're scared. But what do they do once they get there? They preach the word. They continue to spread the gospel of Jesus in these areas that they have gone to. Listen, guys, sometimes when we face trouble, we may not be able to solve it. We may not be able to remove it. We may just be able to face it, but we can turn it. We can turn it upside down. They weren't able to solve this problem. They weren't able to say, let's just eliminate the persecution. No, they couldn't do that. They didn't have the power to do that. But here's what they did. They took what the Sanhedrin and the other authorities took as a, as a bad thing against them, and they turned it into a good thing by spreading the gospel. Literally, literally, the enemies of the church helped spread the gospel because it was because the enemies of the church, the persecution caused the church to scatter into these places where the gospel is spread. I don't know about you, but that's just amazing to me. You know, when I was growing up, I was in a church. When I was a little kid. Went through a church split, just divided. And it was just some bad stuff that was going on there. A lot of things that Christians shouldn't do. Imagine the church being somewhere where things happen that's supposed to happen. They did. And it caused a church split. And listen, my dad had not gone to church my whole childhood. I never remembered my dad going to church other than maybe Christmas and, and Easter. But out of 
response to my mom and out of support for my mom, he started going to church with us because of that split. You know what? He never stopped. Eventually, he rededicated his life. He later became a deacon in the church and then later an elder in that church. Why did he step inside the church? Because of a church split. That was the reason. Listen, God can do amazing things through bad situations. Sometimes you can't change the situation, but you can turn it to something good. I believe that's what happened with my dad. I believe that's what happened in Acts chapter 8 as they began to spread the gospel. It brings to life, or brings to life Romans chapter 8, verse 28. When it says, all, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, being called according to his purpose. Even the bad stuff, good stuff could come out of. If we love God, and we continue to follow his purpose. All right, we're closing Acts 8. Man, I've really gotten into this one. Let's go to Acts 9. This is the last act we're going to cover here. All right, Acts 9. Transform it. You can't remove it. You can't solve it. You can't face it. You can't turn it. Let's just transform it. Let's just change it. One of the biggest troublemakers of the early church was Saul, later known as Paul. Saul, Paul, same person, not to be confused with the Saul of the Old Testament. But we're talking about Saul here who later became Paul. I'm just going to refer to him as Paul. We see in Acts chapter 9, Saul, or Paul's conversion. He's going to persecute the church. He's got an edict. He's got an order from the authorities to be able to go to Damascus and drag people out of their homes and, and persecute them because of their faith, because they are teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus, just because they believe in Jesus. And he's doing all this. And as he goes, he has this experience. This light on the road to Damascus, just blinding light. Literally, Paul goes blind. And he hears this voice. And he asked Paul, this voice asked Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's like, I don't even know who you are. What are you talking about? Who are you? And he says, I am the Lord Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He goes on to give Paul instruction. He gives another guy named Ananias, not the same Ananias from chapter five. This Ananias is a devout follower of Jesus. Paul ends up being baptized. He goes on to preach. Man, he just immediately starts preaching the word. He spends approximately three years in Damascus and surrounding areas just preaching the word. Eventually, he goes to Jerusalem, which is kind of the epicenter of the church here um it's it's where everything is 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 going from and out to the leaders games now the brother of jesus has become kind of a leader in the church along with the other apostles and paul comes into here and they begin to freak out a little bit because they've heard about paul they know all about paul they know that paul is persecuting the church and they're not real sure this guy's genuine yet a guy by the name of barnabas Remember Barnabas from last week? So he's one of those guys who sold some of his property, bought the money to the church. Great encourager. Puts his arm around Paul. Says, guys, I've heard about what he's done in Damascus and surrounding areas. I believe he's legitimate. And I believe if we accept him, he can be a great part of what's going on here. Fortunately, because of the encouragement of Barnabas, the early church, the church there in Jerusalem accepts Paul and eventually Paul becomes the most magnificent spreader of the gospel ever, in my opinion. It is just amazing. Over half of the, the books or the letters in the New Testament are written by Paul. It's just an amazing encounter there where Barnabas, Barnabas as far as we know, wrote no book. But there's at least 13 books that we know of that may not have been written had it not been for Barnabas. Listen, guys, you don't know what God's going to do in your life. Paul probably never imagined that he was going to be blinded in order to see. And that's exactly what happened. He was blinded so that he could see better. Always be prepared for whatever God is going to do in you, through you, 
even to you. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. Because God can do amazing things. Whatever trouble you're going through, God just may take that and transform it. All right, guys, we have covered a, a, a span of time here, a little, little larger than what we did last week. Again, we are continuing to fulfill Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And in all Judea and Samaria, remember, we've gotten there. We're in Judea and Samaria now into the ends of the earth. We're going to begin to see this spread out next week, even beyond Judea and Samaria. We have covered the span of about five to ten years in these chapters that we've covered today. Um, depending on, on who you read, we have now expanded from just Jerusalem to also include Judea and Samaria. And listen. The church has dealt with the trouble. They've dealt with the problems. Some cases it's been removed. Some cases it's been solved. Some cases they just faced it head on. Some cases they turned it around. And in some cases they transformed it. They dealt with it in every case. And after about five to ten years, after the birth of the church, this is the description we get of the church in Acts chapter 9. Verse 31, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit increased in numbers. This is where the church is right now. It's about five to ten years old. And this is the state of the church. We're spreading throughout these other areas, We're enjoying a time of peace being strengthened they're growing stronger they're living in a fear and the honor of the lord they're being encouraged by the holy spirit we cannot deny the ministry of the holy spirit as we read through this book it's powerful and they continue to increase numbers i don't know about you but i'm excited to see where the church goes from here let us pray god we thank you for the church. We thank you that we are part of the church. God, help us to learn from the early church of how we can handle any troubles that may come our way as individuals or as a body of believers. Help us to learn from the example of the church in the book of Acts. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again
guys, thank you for the encouraging words. I don't really look over there during the sermon, and it, but I look over there kind of after I'm finished. And, and so thank you. I appreciate all that. Um, I do expect when we do get in the building, I do expect you all to throw up some amens and stuff like that as we're going, because I know you could do it. I'm seeing it in the comments. So um, just to let you know, we're going to expect that as we continue on. Um, hey, guys, we just want to thank you again for continuing to be faithful givers. Um, you all have done an amazing job and in, in some cases even better <laughs> we were before. So thank you for that. Just a reminder, we've got three different ways uh, that you could continue to give. You can give online at our website, click on the donate button and you can you can give that way. That's probably the easiest way to give if you if you've got that technology in your home. Uh, you can mail it to us at 74 Walnut Road, Lynn Cove, uh, New York, obviously. Uh, you can mail it to us. Or you could just drop it by. Many of you are doing that. And that's that's great as well. If you just want to come by the house and, and drop it off, uh, you could do that. Just let us know and um, and make sure we're home and stuff, and and we can do it that way. But thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that, guys. We continue this series, lights, camera, action. Next week, as you can see, this book is full of action. I mean, this has more action than any action movie you've ever watched, and it only gets better. So you want to keep. Going on, keep moving forward with us in this. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be covering uh, chapters ten through fourteen next week. So if you want to read those ahead of time, and I encourage you to do that, uh, go ahead and do it, and be praying for next week's service. Until then, I love you guys. Go out there and remember: every time you face trouble, you've got options. Love you guys. <laughs>